mocking with the mock king. Ha ha. One surprise riser in the AFC and rule changes that you might not understand because I don't. We'll figure it out. We got all that more. I'm Jason Fitz and it's time for Zero Blitz. Welcome to Zero Blitz. I know usually you're seeing, you're used to seeing Frank Schwab and myself. So it's like Zero Blitz with Frank and Fitz. But, you know, I'm not going to say we upgraded, but we certainly got better looking. Don't tell Frank I said that. Nate Tice hanging out with me uh, today. Nate, I, I need you to pull the weight here, all right? Because you okay. need to be smart and beautiful. That's the I, only I, rule on this I'll podcast. Try. We are the best looking podcast on Yahoo Sports. So there's a lot of pressure out of the kids. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll just go by Fate Feist. That way, I just keep the F <laughs> layer of names going. That way, it just really rolls. You know, you know, fits and fate. That's that's it. That's it. That's what we got. Actually, fate for you is probably I don't know. I don't know if that's good or bad. Like uh, for me, it's like I don't know if I want to tempt that. So I don't know if that is actually good. <laughs> that could be a spinoff. That could be just a little spinoff. Like yeah, we're gonna talk about my my future and everything as that can we, happen uh, from there. <laughs> as we get close to the draft. And by the way, in this episode, Nate and I are gonna do a mock draft. We're gonna go through the whole thing. Uh, I don't, I don't tempt fate going into the draft because let me tell you something like every year I, as a fan, like, I don't know what your experience is a fan. Like you do great work covering the draft, but put your fan hat on for a second. The number of years, especially when I was covering it for the four letter network, the number of years I was sitting live with the camera in my face and I watched the Raiders do the stupidest thing in the world. And it just ripped my heart out. Like the funniest thing to me, and, and I'm glad you're on because Frank does not share my love of the draft. I think the NFL draft is the absolute best moment in the entire sports calendar. Every team is pumped. Every fan base is pumped. Everybody has hope. Yet every year I get kicked in the no-no places when the Raiders come up to the podium. It's like an annual getting a, a text from a group of friends saying, man, I'm so sorry, is an annual damn tradition for me. So I'm not te te tempting any fake gods. So at least, in, what was it, 2018, you got three kicks in the nuts? Mm, yeah. You got both no, nuts yeah, yeah. both nuts and the middle part uh, in 2018. That was a fun little draft for the Raiders there. So Because that was the year with fir three first rounders, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fun, and, is a, fun is a word. Uh, there was there was uh, the, the <laughs> year that... Uh, you got Max Crosby. <laughs> uh, yeah, Max, and Max has, has been you know, a delight. The, the later round picks haven't been the issue. But no. you know, the, the year that they picked Alex Leatherwood, I was live doing a you know, live stream for ESPN. It's the only pick the entire draft that got my ear and they said, stall, we don't have any B-roll because nobody knew that he was going to be picked that high. And so I just looked at the camera and I was like, why do you do this to me every year? And like, I just went off. So the next day I come in and the headline on the Raiders page on ESPN.com was Fitz pleads with Raiders. And I'm like, I'm not even mad about it. Cause I, yeah. I just, just want one thing to be easy. Because that, and that headline wasn't lying. You were no. pleading with them. It was, it was exactly what you were doing. That's no, I, I totally get it. It's, as a neutral fan now, as I just a uh, observer observer of the draft, it is a season of hope. And it's that was when the uh, the draft came here uh, to Vegas and uh, a few years ago. And my wife, who was working at one of the casinos, she was kind of talking to me about. It. She's like, you know, they're really surprised, like the higher ups, that everyone's not staying at like you know like the Bellagio and all those. Like it seems like Circus Circus and all those other places are the ones filling up. I'm like, you gotta understand who comes to the draft. It's a lot of hopeful fans that are there to see their team select a guy. They'll look around and go, do we like that? Okay, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Offensive guard, Tulsa. Uh, sh yeah, I think we like it. I think we like it. Yeah, okay, okay. But it's the best. <laughs> it's the best. I live for those reactions because I've gotten to see them my entire life, and I get to keep seeing them because I keep making this event even bigger and bigger and bigger. I can promise you that that's going to be the reaction when we get to some of the fat boys uh, in this uh, in this particular draft. I I never I will never pretend when we get to our mock uh, to be a great breakdown artist when it comes to thick boys. So I just have a, a group text with all the guys that I know that that I respect. Hey, like you got to have hey, a go certain Joe. amount of junk in the trunk. Like you got to have a certain amount of peach basket. And then I will text you and be like, "Hey, should I like this guy?" And I get the answer of yes or no. And then I just blindly take that as like because the offensive lineman won't lie to you. Like that, that's. Just, no, my my any guy that played in the league will not lie to you about another fat boy. They don't protect each other because they can't they can't hide. Like <laughs> a receiver cannot get the ball all day, and they go, "Wow, I killed that corner!" And uh, you know, but we don't know. But offensive lineman can't hide. You just text Gojo. And you're oh, just like, thumbs right. up, thumbs down. That's all I need to know. <laughs> oh, that, uh, the last year I covered it for ESPN, Mike was no longer with the company. And so I couldn't use Mike on the he show. Just right to and him, so yeah. I, I came up with some like super top secret former fat guy was my, my code for it. So every time there was a pick, I'd be like, hey, I'm texting my super top secret former fat guy. Now, everybody that knows me knows that Kojo is one of my best friends, right? Like we all know who I'm talking, but I couldn't say the name. So it was just my super top, top secret it's, former it, fat guy. It's not deep throat. It's deep bald. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> stealing that I lo- moving forward. I love that guy. I, I love Gojo. Uh, he's he's my guy. That no, but it, the, having said that, all that like usually the lineman, I, I, I get it. Like it's like all right, I guess this guy's supposed to be pretty good. Awesome offensive lineman draft. Like they are yes. actually the stars of this first round and really entering to round two. So it's actually having said all that, and I get it. But there's actually like some notable names that are going to be popping up here because there's a lot of good ones. A hundred percent. And we'll get to them real quick. A couple of big rule changes. I, I mean, we say big, but the hip drop, uh, hip drop tackle has been banned. Nate, like, I, I think we all saw this coming. The only thing that is going to be wild is like, everybody's just going to need to calm the hell down because the first half of the season, I feel like it's going to be this constant yelling of, was it, was it not like, it's going to take a second for everybody to get used to it. And if there's anything we know, sports fans are not particularly patient when it's their team. Like, I feel like this is one where when you're sitting in the sports bar and you don't have a vested interest and you see the call, you will be like, yeah, I get it. And if it's your favorite team, you're suddenly going to look at it and see these guys are idiots and they don't know what they're doing. I am as, again, as a more neutral fan, someone that's been jaded and cynical with some of the NFL stuff. I, I've realized that it all evens out over time. And also, the like you said, the preseason, there's probably going to be a couple botched ones where everyone goes nuts. And then once by the time October rolls around, most people forget about the new emphasis on rules until it comes up on a Monday night game or a playoff game. And then it'll become a talking point for another week and everyone acts like, I'm never watching the NFL again. And then they'll forget about it a week later. But I will say, penalties usually even out. Except there has been studies, real studies, teams that wear black jerseys tend to get penalized more, including your very own Las Vegas Raiders are one. I've always been one of the most penalized teams could be some of the players that they've always identified and gone after. But there have been studies that teams in all sports that wear black jerseys as their primary jerseys get penalized more. So that is something that is a very real thing. Don't know what it is. But it, it is a thing. <laughs> now, <laughs> Thought I'd share that little like, factoid I just there. need the Raiders to wear the whites. Just wear the wear That's the it. away whites. Whites and silvers. Like, silver's still yeah. one of our, one of the colors, right? Oh, but I, I would say with the, the the hip drop stuff is I don't protecting players. I get it. If they if this goes how I think it will go, it end up being like the lowering the head, you know, kind of penalty that like they've only called like four since they've emphasized that penalty. Um, where I think it's gonna be a half dozen of them, maybe ten of them a year. But the thing for me is the fines that come with it. It's kind of a who watches the watchman kind of situation because now they're doing the, they're calling it, they'll find players even if that wasn't called a penalty in real time. So that to me is there's a disconnect. And we know the NFL doesn't really do this well. There's a disconnect between, hey, the refs are infallible. They, they are going to nail this every single time. We're going to make sure they're, the emphasis is on there. They're watching the tackle happen. Guess what? The ones they miss, we're going to find them two days later. So which one is it that they can see everything and they're going to watch the tackle or that they can find them? To me, it's either or. It's either you throw the penalty and there's no fines, or it's a penalty and a fine, but not just no penalty and a fine. Like, you know what I mean? So I think that is what is kind of a who watches the watchman situation that I'm kind of, that that just is typical NFL where they give themselves that leeway to make themselves a little bit more money. <laughs> Can you imagine coming into the office? Like you weren't late. You didn't get yelled at for being late. Everybody, it seemed like you snuck into the office, you're fine. Like nobody said anything. And then all of a sudden, two weeks later, you just get a little fine. And it's like, hey, we've docked you a tenth of your pay for that day because you were two minutes late. Like I would be wild. Like if there's a timekeeper at the office and he didn't give me a penalty for being late and then you find me, I would be mad as hell. Yes. Yes. Because in the real time, no one noticed. So that it didn't happen to me. That didn't happen. It's like taking a walk or, or like a baseball player getting a walk. That bat, that plate appearance, well, the plate appearance, happened. that at bat. Never happened. <laughs> it never and, happened. And also, like, if you find me, but it wasn't a penalty, shouldn't you find the ref for doing a poor is. job? Yeah. Like, right. Or dinged somehow. Like, shouldn't that be there? They're the ones that missed it. <laughs> if that, yeah. So that, that is my one kind of qualm with all this because it's just like, hey, the salary cap went up and the owners are like, yeah, we're going to make sure we get a little bit of that back, just a little bit more of that fine money back. Uh, also, teams now get a third coach's challenge if one is successful. I think that's actually a pretty staggering change. Like the difference in that is massive. Yeah, it, it's completely different from the two plus one. Like if you nail the first two, my uh, my dad actually was one of the proponents for pushing that when he was a head coach. So I kind of with, with that original rule change. So it seemed fitting that Dan Campbell and the Lions, as a former you know blocking tight end, uh, you know quasi everyone thinks he's a kneecap biter you know meathead actually turns out to be a rule savant like dan campbell is like it actually <laughs> felt fitting that dan campbell is the one that pushes forward i actually like this because it's um I, I think there's just this is going to come up i think a couple times in the year 
but it kind of, it changes some of the math on stuff and coaches are going to get a little more loose, I think, with some of the challenges where they're like, hey, you know, especially with timeouts and depending on situations. So I think this will come up a little bit more times, but that is an interesting rule change that I actually I do like. I wonder if it's a precursor to allowing coaches to challenge anything. Like you've given them an extra one. This sort of leads us towards the, now you can use it on any blown call anywhere in the game, which by the way, is what I think it should be. Yeah, especially if they can even just start it with inside two minutes or inside four minutes of the half, and then you can challenge anything. I would like that. So it's not a game-breaking PI penalty or holding or face mask or something like that. But I think that's a really good rule change, especially especially with PIs. Pass interference is the one that's always just going to be the one. But uh, I, I I like that one, and then or hopefully they can get to that one. I also hopefully they can change the kickoff rules. They said it actually was close, where they're going to the hybrid XFL rules, which the NFL is never going to go away with the kickoff because they they love the light bulb flash or now the camera flash. They love that aesthetic of a kickoff starting the game. Like that's fo- it feels like football. I mean, I I love it. Even though all of them end up with touchbacks. But I think that that XFL change, UFL change, they have a. Sam Schwartzstein, that was one of the proponents, the guy that changed it, he works for Amazon now. He has a, a different term for it than XFL kickoff rule. He's like, no, use this term, but everyone calls it the XFL kickoff rule. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that's going to come because they said actually it was close to this year. And I, I actually don't mind that at all. The onside kick one as well, going for making it like a fourth and 15 or fourth I and love, 20. I love that one. Like, I it, like it. Look, it's action. Onside kicks are never recovered. Like, what's, never. The, what's the point? So if I'm if we're talking about a Super Bowl, then let's give, like, if I have the choice between watching a kicker lamely try and get an onside kick to work or a fourth and 15, fourth and 20, whatever they decide it's going to be with the ball in Mahomes' hands, I'd rather have that. Like, that's Absolutely. pretty simple to me. Yeah, it keeps, it rewards teams that have good quarterbacks, which is what you want. And also, it creates excitement. And I think it, NFL and sports in general and rules in general, all possibilities should be viable. You know, if I have to come back, I should have a a realistic way, not a one in a hundred, more like a one in 20 or one in 10 chance of maybe making a comeback. So to me, it's like if you find like a realistic that that can maybe possibly happen, like this is a way to do it. And I know it's there's never going to be a perfect answer, but that's one path where I'm like, okay, this is feasible. The onside kick one and the XFL rule change with the guys are closer. So I I think those are maybe next year. I think they're I think more are coming around to it, but I hope they do, because I think that's a good way forward. Now, there's one other big piece of news this week, and it's Legereus Sneed getting a massive deal from the Titans being traded from the Chiefs. Four-year, $76 million extension. There's two sides to this. Number one, if I'm Patrick Mahomes, I'm not happy. Like, you've already taken away all of his offensive weapons. You've already made him lift more. The defense was what really vaulted them to a Super Bowl. Now, you're like, yep, we're going to make your life a little more difficult yet again. So I didn't love any of this from that standpoint. And and then from the Titans' standpoint, they're certainly aggressive right now. You, you say what you want. Rand Carthon has taken over the reins there wholly without Mike Vrabel in the building. And he's obviously got a much more aggressive player acquisition strategy than Vrabel ever had. Uh, and Rand uh, Carthon, like, the GM there, the Titans, he really just seems to be like a, why not acquire players? Like, hey, I don't win for having the most cap space <laughs> at the end of the year. And they had a ton because they had, were gutting the roster more or less or kind of reconfiguring the roster. So to me, it's a weird, the Titans are such a weird team. I think the owner drives a lot of the stuff that happens there as far as timelines and, and everything. So I think that's always something that you have to keep in the back of your mind. But to me, to them, like when they traded for or signed Calvin Ridley and I got asked, like, why would they splurge on this? Well, now they help out their quarterback and get answers. Do they think Levis is the guy or not? I'm, I'm sure they don't even know. But now they at least give him, there's not that excuse. Well, he needs pass catchers. We got to make sure. Hey, now we're taking away all those excuses, and now we know, is this the guy? We we get answers on what we actually have. We're not competing anyways, but we can maybe compete next year and really shoot up to 2025. We can make a move for a quarterback. So I actually, I've come around on that uh, as far as kind of like being a little bit more aggressive. For the Chiefs side, I thought once they signed Jones that they would still have a way to make Snead work. Uh, Chris Jones, I should say. I thought they would still have the means to do it, especially with the cap of Mahomes, the bank of Mahomes, what they can do with his money. I thought they would have a way to do it. So it is interesting to me, especially his age. And I know corners are very volatile. They can be up and down. But Snead's a player that he's useful no matter what. He can play outside. He can play inside. He can blitz. He can play man coverage. He can do everything. And especially with the window they have now with Travis Kelsey, maybe one more year, maybe two more years left. It's like this is one little window before I think they have to reconfigure. So I don't know. I thought they would maybe push it a little more. 
Yeah, and I thought that's why they'd run it back at them, at least for one year, even one if you year. don't get anything just one, done. Yep. Just, just like, look, he's not happy. I, if you're a team, you don't care. You're just like, hey, we're going to run it back, and you're going to get paid a lot of money, and we're going to figure it out, and then you can go wherever you want next year. That would have made sense. From the Titans' standpoint, I, I do believe, and I think it's important to note, that when you have a young quarterback, you got to invest to see if that guy can be the guy. And the win-win here for the Titans is if you find out Levis isn't the guy, then whoever you end up drafting next year is going to be in a much better situation still. So, like, I just I think it's a smart strategy. Like, you've got a guy in the room. I, you, you're probably not picking somewhere this year in the draft where you'd really want to take somebody other than Levis, I, I wouldn't think. So it gives you the opportunity to be flexible around the rookie contract to see what you have in the rookie and then see where it goes. Like, I'm not personally a big believer in Levis, but I think this is still the right strategy for the Titans. That. Right there. That sentence right there is a good way to put it. Uh, it's like, I'm not sure if Levis is it, but at least they're giving themselves paths. They're building themselves ways to pivot off of Levis or commit to Levis. And I like that. A lot of teams are just, I don't know if the quarterback's the guy, so I don't want to commit to anything. It's like, well, now your team, if he isn't the guy, now your team sucks completely. <laughs> and like, yeah, you might be, but you need assets. You need players. You need picks. You need resources of different ways. The cap is a way to acquire those resources. You have to give yourself room and ways to maneuver, but it's like, you know, just because you have, you, you don't want to just have a ton of space and have a ton of, like, you need players. So I, again, I, I, I don't mind this, and especially the other pieces the Titans defense has, especially up front. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it's interesting what Tennessee's doing. Another way to acquire resources is the NFL draft. And when yeah. we come back, we're going to mock our way through this year's draft with Nate Tice. Um, all right, let's mock it. And so uh, let's establish some rules because every every mock needs some rules. Number one, there will be no trades in this mock because, let's be real, you cannot trust me to be professional enough to not trade the next 18 years of draft picks for my beloved Raiders to get to the top overall pick. CBA and, like, violations. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean that's, I'd be calling in the, the NFL and being like, hey, question just for the room. What's the most I can trade for a first overall pick? And then I would just hand it to Chicago. So uh, no trades in this. Uh, also, that gets too complicated. Uh, Stone doesn't trust us to do basic math. Uh, number two, we're going to go back and forth in this draft. So I'll make a pick. You'll make a pick. I'll make a pick. Number three, uh, I, I won't lie when I get to somebody that I'm like just sort of guessing on and you can make me look smarter. Uh, number four, if you make a pick I don't like or I make a pick you don't like, we get one veto per round. One time okay. per round where you can tell me and I just want you to cut in as I make the pick and scream, go to hell. That's the way we veto on this very professional mock draft. It's just it, go to hell. You know that, you know, like when the pick comes oh, yeah. in, it's just, like, <laughs> <laughs> starts, starts the jingle and then a buzzer sound. <laughs> I wouldn't be mad. Like, could you imagine if they let every fan base have one person win the veto button? Like, and so oh, one like fan money got in the to bank. compete. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Or the fan gets to cash in and make the pick, like on anyone's pick. It's like, all right, Bears take Caleb Woods. All of a sudden you just see. Seth Rollins running in, <laughs> throwing, down the, throwing down the briefcase. <laughs> I am in for this. Like, I am in for a game show all year long, yeah. and whoever wins the game show gets the money in the bank, and they can use it or not use it. Not they use can it. hold it, and if they hold it, their fan that, that fan base can hold it for the next year, too. So you I can have that. multiple money in the banks. By the time, like, if, like, look, the Bears might not bring it in for Caleb Williams, no. but what if the fan that won it happens to be, you know, happened to have been in, in the past a big Justin Fields fan. Maybe there would have been drama. Like maybe right. maybe they would, you know. Uh, so right. oh. like, like the Patriots make a pick and all of a sudden Bill Simmons is running down. And just <laughs> 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 he's got his briefcase to cash it in. <laughs> I, I just, sort of though want it to be like a common fan nobody knows. Yeah. Like everything's been done behind a, behind a wall all season. So we don't even know. We see a whole theater full of people. Just a guy runs we out. don't know who has the money. Like I we love don't know. That. Like, oh. Is it a card? Is it a card in the bank? Like, you know, because usually it's just the card, the draft card. Like it's a special yeah. one. Like it's a gold card, like a Willy Wonka ticket. Like that. That's what the one they're running up with. Okay, but it's like American Ninja Warrior. You have to get to the buzzer before the next thing hits. I so like, like that even the better. Pick hits, and then you have thirty seconds. I like. So that. now I'm watching like some some like just huge monster dude when, like just bowling people oh, over yeah. to get to the button before it hits. Oh yeah, they're, they're, you're everyone's praying it's not a Packers fan because. <laughs> 
because of the size. <laughs> so, but you know how they have each draft draft team, like uh, or like team, like fan base at, at the draft. They're all in like their own little section. It's like their own little like, hey, you know, like you know, District Nine, you're over here, you know. But it's really like you know, Packers fans, you stand here. You know, Cowboys fans, you stand here. But that's the thing. It's like, oh wow, what if it's a pick twenty nine? They're in the back right, and they got thirty seconds. Ooh, and there's analysis on that. What is the best path? If they, to get from the back right there, are they going to hope for a trade up here so they can move up? Like, oh yeah, I like the strategy what, with this. Uh, or we could do like a squid game thing where the other fans in your own division get to battle you and prevent you from putting in the card. So like they like if, if, as a Raiders fan that watches my team just the bed. Sorry, Stone, you're going to have to beep that every single year in the draft. If we just if I watch that, I'm desperately trying to get the card up to the front, but I got to get through a Chargers fan, a Broncos fan, and a Chiefs fan That's good. that are all trying to stop me from getting the card up to the front. Oh. I, th- I thought it was going to be the squid game Roger Goodell turns around, and that's when everyone gets... <laughs> 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 all right, all right. Stone, Stone and Brett are going to actually like put the money in the bank thing here and replace me if I don't get to the money. Okay, uh, some of these we're going to go quickly, and I don't think yeah. there's a lot of analysis. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, wh- one last question: Are we doing what we would do, what we think the team would do, or a combo mix of both? I do combo mix of both. Even when I do okay. normal mocks, I kind of do that. I try to do what I would want them to do, but sometimes I'm like, ah, eh, this team, the Raiders. I don't know, <laughs> so I don't know what I, I, I would go with there. I got the first pick in the draft, and Stone is already clicking on the word Caleb Williams because we all know he's going to Chicago. By the way, I do think we've made this too complicated. The only thing I'll say about Caleb Williams is overanalysis is a real thing. And at some point, what I love is body of work. And for many of these quarterbacks, because of COVID, we have a bigger body of work than ever. So while oftentimes we're coming in looking at quarterbacks and saying, I don't know, could he turn into this? Could he turn into this? I think what we have to remember is we have a better concept of who most of these quarterbacks are today, right now, than we've ever had in any draft in NFL history with a few very notable exceptions. Caleb Williams is not one of them. While I think there is reasonable concern about his ability to make plays on schedule, there is no concern about his ability to make plays. And frankly, if you're the Bears and you've never had your guy, you get your guy right now. This is a chance for them to have their franchise quarterback, first overall pick. And by the way, I don't think this is complicated. I think Caleb has everything that you could want from a number one overall pick to be a great quarterback. I, I do too. I love Caleb and I love the next guy. I'll take, but I'll give my Caleb analysis right now. But it, it's, I watching him and studying him and what I wrote up for Yahoo, it was watching him game after game after game. Of course, all the playmaking stuff is crazy and it's all that and all the stuff that you can do ad lib, throw a sidearm, and the Mahomes comparisons come from that. But just like Mahomes is that he's underrated operating from the pocket. He is, I, the comparison I came, which was kind of a bit, but there was some truth behind this, is I compared him to Drew Brees when he was coming out Purdue. Because of the accuracy, because of how clean his footwork was when he had a pocket to actually work from. That USC offensive line sucked. Uh, it, it was not good. And it was the scheme was not great, which is very surprising for Lincoln Riley. And I just thought some of the concepts and stuff. But I, I really like Caleb. He, he doesn't have the perfect height, but I think he's over 6'1", but he has good size and he's thick. He th- works over the middle. He's accurate. I would say he's excellent, uh, excellent accuracy. Big, big fan of Caleb Williams for pick but- two. Oh, yeah. So we're on the clock. Real quick, I will say we got to give a good shout out here. A smart note. A Pro Football Network's mock draft simulator is what we're using to track this. So that's helping us get through it on the screen. So good work by them having this up uh, for everybody. You should go check it out. It's it's a really good tool if you are uh, if you want to just go through mock after mock after mock like some of us uh, idiots want to do. Number two, it's clean. Uh, Washington's on the clock. So good, sir. That is your pick for the commanders. I am going Washington commanders. There's a lot of smoke about Jane Daniels from LSU, but I am staying firm with the guy that I think is in the same tier as Caleb Williams, which is saying something. But that's Drake May from North Carolina. I'm a big, big fan of May. And I know there it's silly season. There's so much smoke out there with Daniels and everything. Daniels is a fine player in his own right. But I think May is, like I said before, in the same tier as Caleb Williams. That's how high I view him because of just the size, athleticism, st- aggressiveness. I actually think his, his, some of those pre-snap mental stuff has gotten, you know, everyone's is acting like he's a big arm dummy. Uh, he's very, very sharp and very advanced for, he's a redshirt sophomore. He's younger than these other, he's even younger than Caleb. So I'm, I'm very high on May. And I think these two are Williams and May are true, true prizes of this draft. So can I just stating the obvious here? I don't want anyone to, to compare Drake May to Sam Howell. I just, I feel no, like that people see like, oh, well, they both came from the school, like two wildly different quarterbacks wildly. in every possible way. And To your point, I would say to every fan base out there, if you find out that your team traded an uncomfortable amount of picks to move up to number two and it's to get Drake May, I still think you won. 
Like I, I, I think in, in any draft, Drake May's the guy. You move up. I, I'm a big believer you only move up to take a quarterback. And then it's the next caveat, which is you only move up to take a, a guy, you know, like a real, not a Mac Jones of the world where like, oh, he could be a decent starter, but like a real guy. To me, May is a real guy. I, I, I've been trying to figure out because I've had to go through different grading systems based on where I was at. But the one I'm currently doing just as a, a private investigator of the draft, <laughs> I guess I'm not private. I guess I get paid to do it publicly. <laughs> but uh, but my own grading system is Mil- uh, Williams and May. Since I've officially started watching guys since 2014's draft, they're two of my top four prospects uh, 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 at quarterback uh, up there with Trevor Lawrence, just as prospects, just when they're coming out. Up there with Trevor Lawrence, like I, I think these guys are real, real, real dudes. What I call purple chips, which is higher than a blue chip, and that's hard to do. And that's what these two guys are. That's what the five hundred dollar chips are, right? Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah. It's purple I mean, five hundred. Not that that ever happens. For, we got to call Golick <laughs> to find that out. Uh, I, I, I will say this too. Um, to that point, White to chip. the point of the excellence <laughs> that you're pointing out. These two quarterbacks are far better than any quarterbacks we expect to see in next year's draft, which yes. is part of why you you just have to factor that into the trade value that Washington does have should they choose to move down. I'm I'm on the clock with three, and this is where things get a little tricky because I, I do believe that if you are the New England Patriots, uh, you are completely resetting your entire organization. We know that, and that means you take Jaden Daniels here. Do I think three is too high for Jaden Daniels? Probably. Do I think that there is some development like, hey, we got some questions about Jaden Daniel, and, and particularly as I talk to people that I think are even smarter than than most of us, when you look at the breakdown of Jaden, like clean pocket versus not clean pocket, real questions, accuracy numbers when he's being pressured up the gut are real questions. Like there are questions about Jaden. There's no question about his athleticism. There's no question about his ability. And there's no question that the Patriots know that they are in Josh Allen's division and they don't have a quarterback. So as a result, I think quarterback, even though if you were just making a mock and just saying, is Jaden Daniels the third best player in this year's draft? No. Is Jaden Daniels, to me, the quarterback that, you know, you, you'd sit here and say, hey, fail proof. You trade up and go get that guy. No. Is that who New England takes at three? I think it makes the most sense. It makes sense because, like you said, they have Jacoby Brissett. Jacoby Brissett's a fine starter, but I think this regime wants their guy. You know, that's what every, even if it's Mayo, who has been a Patriot guy, that's a new GM with Elliot Wolf. And, you know, he, they, a lot of these guys, when they get a regime, they go, and like you said, they might look at next year's class and go, I don't know. I'd rather take my chance on Daniels than any of those guys. You never know how it all unfolds. You never know how it all breaks down, but sometimes you just want to commit to a guy and then, okay, now we can build up from here. And if he sinks us, he sinks us, but at least we're, this is the guy we're swinging with. If they like him, that, that's why I've always gone with quarterbacks. Like you said, I have Daniels at 19th, I think on my big board, 18th, 19th, some, one of those two on my big board right now. Uh, so that technically with a late first, early second round grade, quarterbacks get inflated by a half round, no matter what their grade is. So I, we'll talk about another guy in a minute, McCarthy. But Daniels, if he's 19, half a round, that's top 10. <laughs> that's that's kind of how it works. Like not everyone is May or Williams, which are easy number one picks. It, it's like, that's how usually these guys get bumped up in the top 10 because there's that inflation. So I, and, like you said- And right or wrong, that, by the way, yeah. I don't think there's anything I don't think there's legitimately this year in the draft, I don't think there's anything any team can offer any of those three teams to move out. I don't think it would be accepted by anybody. I think one, two, three are going to be quarterbacks, and that doesn't, to, to the point I made earlier, I think if if a team like Minnesota or the Broncos or the Raiders turned around and offered four years of first-round picks, I still don't think the Patriots move out of three because they do not have a quarterback and it just matters too much so i think one two three are locked and everybody else is screwed if they want to go uh, if they want to go quarterback for the top three so you're on the clock now with four which again i think is going to be a hotbed for trades when oh, yeah. we get into the actual draft but we're no trading so what are we doing it for oh the best non-quarterback in this draft going with marvin harrison jr from ohio state which still might be a possibility for the cardinals they might just go screw all you guys we're just going to take the dude uh, I'm actually going to write about Harrison Jr. this week, so check that out on Yahoo. But I, I think he's a no-brainer. I, I like don't overthink him. I know there's some other hype going with Malik Neighbors right now from LSU, who's also a very good player and a top ten graded guy by me, and it's just about everybody else. Uh, but I think Harrison Jr. is just so clean. That's that's the word I come back to. He has size. He has great hands. He has great catching range. He is an advanced route runner. I would say. One of the best route runners I've watched coming out uh, uh, as a prospect, and he's 6'4". Usually, the other good route runners, Chris Olave was one coming out of Ohio State. 
He's not six four. <laughs> He's six foot and one eighty and change. Not the size that Harrison Jr. is with hands, with strength, with catching strength, with ball skills. With he can work from the slot. He can work outside. He can beat press. He's the only thing that he is not, I would say, above average or better at or good or better at is with the ball in his hands. He's kind of simple. He just plants his foot and gets north. He's 6'4", 205. If he was breaking guys off, everyone would be like, holy crap, Like this is the greatest football player I've ever seen. He's what, he's a really, really good one. Uh, so I just think Harrison Jr., don't overthink him going here. I, I actually love him with the Cardinals, with Trey McBride, Kyler Murray. I really like their offensive coordinator, Drew Petzing. I, I think they could they could be a very interesting offense if they take Harrison Jr. It's a it's a brilliant pick by you. And by the way, uh, humble brag, I'm a Bolitnikoff Award voter. Uh, and the Are number you now? Stu- yeah, I am. Yeah, I think I'm the only person in history to have a Grammy vote and a Bolitnikoff Award vote. But uh, I'm just throwing my What's, resume out now. Your own I'm version just, of the Tony. I'm just, yeah, I'm <laughs> or not like, the Tony, the, the EGOT. The, the EGOT. EGOT, yeah. The EGOT, 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 uh, EGOT. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the one number that stood out to me on Harrison this year when I was looking into it and talking to wide receivers and trying to get smart – uh, was zero, and that's the number of drops that he had the entire season. So everything. never credited with the drop. Like that's just that's real. That's like it, it's just uh, to me, he's consistent, and we're overcomplicating it. I love the pick. So and all the, that all the stats, stuff, all the other stats stuff, like yards per route run, all that, he's at the top. So it's like stat eye test. I call him my Nick Swisher prospect, which is from mm. Moneyball, where it's eye test and the, the numbers all say this guy's a star. Yeah, I, I, he's a Nick Swisher. Done. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and now I'm going to turn that into a Swisher suite in my head, which is a very, very, uh, that's, a, that's a reference. You got to be a certain age. <laughs> it's been a party while. Party a certain way as a kid <laughs> to have that reference. Okay. I'll say 17 years since I've thought about Swisher suite. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Brother. Freshman year of college. Uh, <laughs> I, got the, uh, I got the Chargers next on the clock. And this one gets a little bit interesting. Again, I think they're a prime candidate to trade also. Uh, but it gets interesting to me because I look at the cuts that they've had to make, and I think the Chargers are in the beginning of a gutting of their roster. So now you have to make a choice in a wide receiver thick draft, right? you got a bunch out there. Do you give yourself another little toy to play with, which would be awesome? But I don't want to overcomplicate this. Joe Alt is spectacular. Like, he's not good. He's great, right? And in some drafts, I genuinely believe that Joe Alt would be considered uh, in consideration to be the top overall pick. He's one of yeah. those guys that everybody loves for a reason. I take Alt to the Chargers, and then I just tell myself right now, doesn't matter. Like we get so worried, by the way, and, and we'll talk about this with the offensive linemen in general. Like Alt, plug and play, fine. We get so worried about what position guys are going to play on the offensive line. Uh, do I need a left tackle? Do I need a right tackle? If you look at drafting history over the last several years, positionless drafting for the offensive line group has become a real thing. So I get myself somebody that, look, I, I think I can plug and play him on the left side for the rest of his career. But also, I know that if things get weird, I can put him on the right side if I have to. Like, there's nothing Alt can't do, so I take Joe Alt and and I, I and that's a home run. Like, whatever team yeah. gets Joe Alt, I'll just tell everybody, that's as significant to your franchise, in my mind, as getting that quarterback that we've talked about through the course of the beginning of the draft. No, the, the offensive line in this draft are nuts. At the top, and just the depth of them, all is his closest physical profile and testing profile is Jonathan Ogden. That which is yeah, I don't know if people for anyone who doesn't remember Jonathan Ogden, he uh he was really good. <laughs> he played he was the number three pick, I think, for the Ravens, uh, and and played left tackle there from UCLA. Uh, I mean, shoot, he gigantic six, over six eight. He was listed six nine. That was the thing, was I knew Alt was tall. I didn't know he was over legit over six eight, listed six nine type of tall. Um, but just movement abilities, I'm with you. Converted tight end, he's super young. I was a little scared here. I thought I was gonna have to drop my veto that you're gonna go with a receiver or a Brock Bowers here because yeah. that's what Chargers fans want so badly. And I'm just like, all right, do you guys see who your head coach is? And he, he and he has final say. Have you ever seen a Harbaugh team not invest in the trenches? That's where I think he's gonna invest in. Even if they do need receivers, I think they can get that in the second round. So love this pick. Real quick, I'll say this. A couple of years ago, I was talking to a bunch of the draft Knicks at ESPN. And one of the guys, I don't remember which one it was. One of the guys said, I wish fans understood that if they had a draft where they had never heard of a single one of the guys picked, but they were all fat guys on the offensive and defensive line, that could probably be the best draft in that team's history. So I I just, we just forget that. All right. So you're on the clock with the Giants at this point. I am. And this is uh, Giants. I'd actually almost wish they can move back just a little bit just to help themselves out. But your line point, your offensive line point about getting the best five out there, that's so true. And there's some guys out here we're going to talk about. But Giants need juice. Giants need pass catchers. Giants need someone that can actually play on the outside and not just the slot. And that is going to be Malik Neighbors from LSU, which I think is a, a common pairing between these two. It makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, I Neighbors is all about explosive plays. I have Roman Dunze from Washington a little bit above Neighbors, but I have him, Dunze, Neighbors, and Harrison Jr., all as top 10 graded guys on my big board. Neighbors is just a walking, talking, explosive play. Uh, take stuff underneath to the house. Take stuff over the top. Interesting ball skills on the outside. So I think this Giants offense that needs juice, that's what Neighbors provides. Just real, real juice. I've seen comparisons to him to DJ Moore. I've seen an OBJ. I, I want to go all the way with OBJ with him. But that's the type of player where he's going to create yards after the catch, time and again, create explosive plays. I think this fits great. Yeah. Uh, only only quick thing. Any con- consideration for a quarterback there? Because I mean, it, I, I think trades are going to blow this. No, no, no. That trades no are, in real life. I, I think trades are going to kind of make this wonky. I don't know if Joe uh, Joe Douglas. Oh my God, no, it's not Joe Douglas. Brian Dable. They look alike, which is just way different heights. My brain went to Joe Douglas for some reason, but Dable. I don't know if he would like a guy like McCarthy. Um, I, I just, cause I, I think he likes a kind of like a bigger body guy, you know, a guy that can really be a bruiser and take the touches and everything. That's, I, that's just, I have no idea. Uh, but that would be the next best. So that's why I say, I think they'll go receiver here or look to move down. Cause again, you never know who's going to fall in love with these quarterbacks, but I don't know if the giants like McCarthy is their guy. Okay. So that means the Titans are on the board and look, the Titans are going offensive line. So this is going to be at this point. This is a fat guy. And the Titans are, are wildly disappointed that Joe Walt was not on the board. Like, uh, there's no no doubt about that. So this becomes about Olu Fashanu or about Fuaga out of Oregon State. And I know, like, Fuaga could go inside, outside. I, I And everybody's downgrading Fashanu, and I don't know why. Like, I don't, don't know. Don't listen to it. <laughs> I, I, that, to me, this is like, th- it makes sense to go with Olu here. Like, I think that's the one that makes sense for him. So I, I will take him here. I think it's, I looked at a mock over the weekend that had him all the way near the bottom of the first round. And it just, this is fatigue on guys that have played really well. I don't understand it. And I think, by the way, the Titans get a home run here. Like, I think that's a very good pick for them. I've had Olu as my tackle one until very recently. And then all just got him because the testing was so good. But it's not, Olu, it was just a flop. It wasn't like I dropped Olu down 10 spots. It was just, oh, I think I have him, where do I have him? I have him at six and seven on my big board. But, you know, so <laughs> two very, very highly graded guys. I think Fashano is amazing. I, I really like him. I think the stuff, the woes or, or, or the blemishes people have brought up in the run game, I don't see it because I think he's a good athlete and he's strong. The number one thing is he has small hands, which is, but that doesn't show up on film. So that's the thing is if he, he has uh, eight and a half inch hands, which is, I think there's only one first round tackle in the last decade that had uh, that size hands, Isaiah Wynn, who went to the Patriots. Mm-hmm. But I think. Looking at that, looking at that tackle stuff, I never see that come up. I never see him lose because of small hands. I, I, like, I don't see it pop like when he strikes a defender being a negative for him. So I, that's why I, I'm not as concerned at that. The Ohio State game this year, he kind of got he got beat up a little bit, but he was injured. So when he got beat up and was trying and, and was trying to play through it, it didn't look great. I think that's in a lot of people's heads. Like, oh, he played tough competition, didn't look good. Watch him against Michigan. Washington gets other good schools, and he looks great. So, yeah, I don't know why he's dropping, but I still consider him a top 10 guy. So I love it. Love it here at seven. All right. Look at us agreeing so far. All right. I so know, that means you're, you're on the clock at this point, and you are on the clock with Atlanta with our I next know. big win. This yeah. one's been tough for me because, like, I, I I want to give them another receiver so badly just for fun. Uh, but just, you know, even if Arthur Smith's not there anymore, I'm going to go with – but I'm going to go with defense. I'm going to go with Dallas Turner, which is a very common pairing for them. I actually like this more. I don't think Dallas Turner is going to be a, a high-end sack guy, like a 12, 14, 15 sack guy. I think he's going to be more like an eight sack guy. And I'm saying this is a total negative. I think he's a very useful player. He can drop into coverage. He can play the run really well. And he can get after the passer. They need anyone. They can get after the passer there. I actually like Dallas Turner as a perfect fit for what Raheem Morris does, their new head coach on defense. He, he's a classic 3-4 uh, Sam or a Jack, as they call it now, where he can drop into coverage. He's an outside linebacker type, drop into coverage, do everything, uh, be a, uh, games and twists and uh, spy the quarterback. He can do everything really well. Raheem Morris used a guy, Michael Hoyt, last year with the Rams in that role. Michael Hoyt's about 308 pounds. He's built like a T-Rex. He is not meant to play in coverage or in play in space. And then here, like he gets his, uh, Raheem Morris would get his perfect fit with Dallas Turner to do that. So I've talked myself into this fit a little bit more. Okay. So talk me into, because I'm on the clock now with the Bears and their moves this offseason, I think, make wide receiver a luxury. But I cannot help the fact that Roma Dunze is still sitting there. Do and it. Roma Dunze is too good to sit there. So do it. I put Roma Dunze to the Bears and I Love don't even it. blink. 
And I, I think part of what we have to understand is that the wide receiver position, now guys get paid so much, you've got to start to look to the draft to get a guy, right? So I think having the ability to reset contracts on that in a couple of years becomes key for them too. So even though it doesn't feel like a glaring need because I think the Bears have frankly had a spectacular offseason, even though it's not a glaring need, it's too good of a pick not to have there. So now you get, you know, Rome and, and Caleb grow up together a little bit in this offense at the same time. I love this. Yeah, Ryan Poles has been on a 12-month heat check right now. <laughs> like I, I think even the Keenan Allen thing, Keenan Allen's only under contract for one year. So r- having Keenan Allen it should not preclude you from keep adding to your receiver position, especially if you can get a blue-chip guy like Roman Dunze. Yeah, I, I love him there for the Bears. Dirty work guy. He can do everything. Uh, he's one of my favorite players in the draft, so love that fit. All right, so uh, then you're on J- the clock with the Jets. J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. Yes, I know. We Charles and I got a little funky with it our most recent one, I gave him Brock Bowers, but I'm actually going to go back to the basics here. Even with their offensive line signings, I'm going to go with J.C. Latham from Alabama, who is built like a globe. He is very round, <laughs> but he, is, he has good footwork. He has, I know, they we have him 19 on here. I have J.C. Latham as number eight on my big board. He is a uh, plays right tackle at Bama. I think he could end up at left tackle if you want to, but he also could end up at guard. So, but I really think he has the athleticism to stay at tackle, even if he's built more, just his body type, because he's just so rounded, looks more like a guard. His footwork, his hand strength, he's the best run blocker in the draft, in my estimation. Um, I think even with their signings, you know, they signed Tyron Smith uh, and, and uh, other other guys to kind of like fill out their bodies. Again, keep adding talent to that position, keep them upright. Offensive line injuries happen, and now you get a guy with real pedigree to help you out. So, Latham, yeah, Latham to the Smith, Jets. Smith helps helps Latham's development too. Like, so yeah. I, I think all of that works together. So hey, I'm, former I'm all pro. How'd you handle this type of guy? Wow. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> so now the Vikings run to the podium because somehow miraculously in this, a quarterback is available to them. Uh, and, and that's going to be JJ. Uh, but I will say this, as I've said this repeatedly, anyone that tells you they know on JJ, mm, and this is to me such a guess. It is such a, he can have all the intangibles in the world and we can see his pro day and see that he throws the ball incredibly well. We can talk about the control of a pro offense that he was asked to run without as much help from coaching. All of these things are really smart pieces of J.J. McCarthy. But I flat out asked Harbaugh at the national championship game, if he's the best quarterback he's seen in a generation, why did they not utilize him more in the offense? And I still haven't gotten a good answer to that. I believe if you had an Andrew Luck behind center, you would probably showcase the skills of Andrew Luck behind center. I also believe believe that it is at the very least soft for Harbaugh to continue to say he's the best quarterback in this draft when Harbaugh knows flat out he doesn't have to take a quarterback in this class. So there's no recourse to his actions. So no, we're not sitting not. here saying, oh, you're going to trade Justin Herbert and reset the contract clock for like, that's not a world that Harbaugh lives in. So whatever he says holds no weight with me. I just think that I can't ignore the smoke. Everybody tells me that JJ is going to be great. So fine. I put JJ to the Vikings, but I, I I think it's fair to look at all of this and say, who knows? <laughs> yeah. He's the ultimate. Who's who knows he, uh, I have him in my thirties on my big board. I, I, I mean, I'm just following the smoke here and I, it's one of these guys. I watch him. He grew on me at more. I watched him, but it still is like, I'm still having him in my thirties on the big board. It wasn't like I bumped him up to top 15. I think uh, my concerns with him are size uh, even if he weighed at 218 or 219 at the combine, he is not that. He's 200 pounds. Like it was just, he, he was listed at 195 his whole career. It's not like they're going to fudge that. At Michigan, they're going to try and bump that up. They'd be like, "Oh, you're you're 202, you're 210 on our board on our uh, on our roster." So that always disconnect. I have a lot of uh, uh, qualms with guys who are sub 205, sub 210, really. Daniels and McCarthy were never listed above that. Listed above 205, there's not a lot of success with those types of guys with that body type. In recent times, it's just Kirk Cousins, which is kind of funny that Minnesota mm. really mm-hmm. seems to really like McCarthy. Uh, uh, he also whips that ball over the middle, which the, the Shanahan guys are going to love that. And he can throw on the move. So it's those two little traits. Those guys are going to really like. And I think that's why he gets a lot of hype. The intangible stuff for me is like all these guys got intangibles. I, I like, are you kidding? Like Drake may and, and Caleb Williams. I've seen these guys run over offense, uh, defense alignment. I've seen these guys will their teams to victories. It's like they have intangibles too. So if you're just saying that is like his, positive that means I, there's not enough on film to go like oh there it is oh it's arm strength or it's this it's because they're trying to grab grasp the straws anyways but and he can't throw left that's another thing no one else is bringing up i wrote about it he can't throw yeah left. I, your writing on that was great by the way uh Zulated. all right <laughs> that, that means that that the broncos are sitting at 12 they also yeah. don't have a quarterback what do, do we what, what are we doing i instead of quarter i'm going corner 
back for them. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pair them with Terry and Arnold from Alabama. So I can mm. get a really fun Alabama pairing on the outside for the Broncos. Fun for me as a neutral fan who does not care about the rest of the team of the Broncos. But Terry and Arnold is battling for me with Quinion Mitchell from Toledo as my corner one. Uh, feisty, smart, can play inside. We'll love him with Sertan. we get that Bama connection on the outside for, for Broncos. They need a lot of help everywhere. Just get talent. I am so mad at you right now. Were you going to the Raiders? Really, I was really set that we were going to go the 13th overall pick was going to be Arnold. Like the, It just it makes sense. The Raiders need a corner one. I, I was no set Quinia. with that. No uh, here's here's my, my issue, and this is, this is real for the Raiders this year. If this scenario comes out, now you got to make a decision. Is Bo Nix or Michael Penix Jr. the guy at 13? And I think the answer to that, frankly, to me, is no. Now, no. people smarter than me keep telling me that Bo Nix is going to be gone before 13 even happens. Oh I would God. be stunned. But if that's where we sit, if I'm the Raiders, I'm looking around saying, I know I need a quarterback, but that quarterback at 13 doesn't feel right to me. And, and I can't get past that. I think Michael Penix Jr. and Bo Nix could both turn out to be very good players. But at 13 right now, you have a chance to get a guy that can be an everyday permanent starter on a team that needs that. And I know there's a need for quarterback, and I know every Raiders fan right now that's going to see this clip is going to tell me I'm trash and I'm awful because I didn't take one of the quarterbacks when they're on the board. I just, man, now, I, I mean, I feel like if I'm the Raiders, I know I have holes all over the offensive line that are they're going to be real, and I know I still need a corner. So this becomes, do I take Mitchell or do I take Fuaga? And I'm going to go with Fuaga. I, I am tired of offensive line play being an issue. Uh, I think that this team's got holes to address on that side. Uh, and I'll go back to, you know, what Mike said. I, I went to Gojo asking him about him. I don't have to make him super secret on this show. And his <laughs> his response to me, he's awesome. Could be a guy that kicks into guard, technically very NFL ready, an absolute mauler in the run game with a great nasty streak to him. He's a certified people mover and one of my favorite players I've gotten to watch. When a fat guy tells me that, I think that's the endorsement I need. So I go with a very boring I'm taking offensive line here, and I'm just going to figure out what happens next. I'm going to support this. Yeah, this Raiders fans the, are going to kill me for this. No, so I'm they, just going to get they need get boring. Crushed. They need boring. Yeah, it's a non-veto for me. It's a encouragement Ooh. that you went. You went this. I, I like this. A non-one. So no, I like. I like this a lot. Yeah, Fuaga, uh, uh, Fatanu, uh, Fontnu. I, I, I blank his. I mess up his name every single time. Um, he uh, who's also from Washington was a great player too. Can play five spots. I think uh, at the at the next level. It's really what flavor you want, but Fuaga is a good player in his own right. Yeah, I can stay attacking tackle, bump inside a guard. Everything Gojo said is right on. So that uh, was good analysis <laughs> from uh, them. And forg I forgive like me, Raiders fans. In a real world, I don't think the quarterback's there, or I think the Raiders try and trade back if they're going to take the quarterback. You can't do it at 13. So that means the Saints are on the clock, and my Menchies are just screwed. <sighs> I, I, and I'm I'm keeping it boring. Uh, uh, I'm going I'm going offensive line here. Going to uh, Fatanu uh, from Washington. I butcher his name every time, but I think I got it now. Uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, but I was—I I thought I was fought new for a year. Yeah, you know, I've been mm. talking to him. I love him, so I'm like praising him every show, every show. I haven't gotten his name right until this week. So uh, Fatanu, though, but he's—he's he's a left tackle for Washington. I always thought his length might be an issue. Turns out, 34 and a half inch arms, 34 and a quarter arms, great. Uh, so that made me more encouraged that he can hang at either tackle spot. I uh, actually talked to Gojo about him, and he were, he actually asked me, he was like. You think he could play center? And we both agreed that his ass is perfect for center. His stance and <laughs> ass are perfect for center. We were in agreement on it. So I've unlocked that, or I've kind of come to the point. I think he has five position upside, um, whether I think at right tackle, Pro Bowl upside. Left tackle, like above average to good starter. Guard, center, Pro Bowl type upside. So I think four spots, he has good quality starter upside and left tackle, he can get you through in a pinch. For this Saints team that... Ryan Ramchick might be, um, this might be his last year. The Trevor Panning experience has gone very sour, like the Willy Wonka boat ride. The left, they have no idea what they're doing on their left side. Okay, what spot does he play? I don't know. Get him on the field. Get our best five out there and we could figure out, we could drop in and rebuild our own line. So I actually think this is a great fit if they want to be boring for once in their life, but n the New Orleans Saints never want to be boring. Uh, yeah, I could see them reaching it wide receiver there. Uh, all right, not reaching, but uh, I, the Bowers. culture on the clock. And speaking <laughs> of reaching, some people are going to call this a reach. 
I, this is not a reach. This is a player I would have taken at 13 before the Christian Wilkins signing for the Raiders. I think Byron Murphy, the fact that he's oh, still sick. sitting on the board at 15 is is absolutely a, an abomination. We're talking like and the fact that we're having to scroll through to find him on the screen is just wildly underrated. Like Byron Murphy, defensive tackle out of Texas, comes in and immediately shores up the middle of that. Like I still wouldn't be surprised to see somebody take him in the top half of the first round and have people yell about it. As important as interior pressure has become from the defensive line. He's a guy that can not only hold against the run, but he can also move the pocket when he needs to. I like. I just if Christian Wilkins hadn't been signed by the Raiders, I would have put him in Vegas. Instead, he goes to the Colts, where I think he has a nice run. I, I like that. Yeah, they they need DeForest Buckner, good player, but and Grover Stewart's a good player, but Grover Stewart's a run plugger. You know, he's not going to create sacks. He's always, so like you get a nice three man kind of rotation there. And Murphy, Murphy's got juice. We talk about the other positions. He a defensive tackle. He's got juice. He's a he's an explosive play for the defense. TFL sacks pressures. I, I, I like that pick a lot because they need they need that. They have a lot of solid players, but they need juice up front. And he provides that. I think better than the edges that are remaining in this class right now. All right, so the All Seahawks right, on Seattle. the clock. What do you got there? Wow, this is I, I want. So I actually have kind of like head cannon my way into this one because I did on this last mock, and now I'm like, oh, I actually really like this one. Going offensive line once again. Graham Barton from Duke. Oh, yeah. getting him all the way up here at 16. I think this is when his range starts. So, yeah, he scroll down. He's 31 on there. You know where he's on my big board? That dude is Barton is at 12 on my big board. I love this guy. Uh, play left tackle at Duke, has played center at Duke. He can play all five spots. All that discussion I just had on the last guy, yeah, we can carry over to Barton. <laughs> I think he more has four position upside. I don't know if he can hang at left tackle, but I think he can hang at right tackle in a pinch. But for the Seahawks, he's interior. He's a left guard or a center. They need it. They lost their left guard. They're going on a fifth round uh, second year player at center. The old guy from Michigan, who I actually like. But again, we're talking about get our best five out there. If you get a Barton, he lets us figure out and fill the spots for us. The Seahawks last year, I know it's a new regime. Man, they just their whole offense fell apart because they couldn't block the interior. They were just getting blasted. Poor Gino was just getting blasted in the face every week. Couldn't even step up in the throws. So. I think you get a real, real needle mover talent that's also solid. Like he's this is a sexier pick <laughs> that I think people will realize, but he really is because of what he can do and what he can unlock for the whole offense. And I think it's a good need fit too for the Seahawks. Graham Barton, Duke, sexy. Uh, all right, so the Jags <laughs> on the pick. The Jags on the clock. That's where here. your head went, right? You're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. yeah, all the way. Um, Jags are are tempting for me in a couple of ways because I could honestly see them going with Latu. I could see them going with Mitchell because I think edge and corner are both good needs for him. But also, I do think that they need to continue to figure out their weapons. So I'm going to go Brian Thomas, wide receiver out of LSU. Uh, I, I think that for them, especially, I mean, look, Calvin Ridley, they got to replace. They're, they're going to have, I think the Jags have more work to do on their roster than a yes, lot of people do. So do. I think the Jags are a really good candidate in this year's draft at this point to trade down. If they don't trade down, they've got a bevy of options. I don't think they go wrong with any of them, but getting another weapon for Trevor Lawrence is not the worst idea considering they're still trying to figure out what they have in one of the most sure thing prospects I can remember in the draft. I know they're, they're, and they're like not rewarding them. They're saying he still has to prove it. He want to playoff game brought him back from double digits yeah yeah oh yeah, yeah we're not gonna pay him yet we're not even talking extension oh my god there honestly since i've been in media just say this ongoing jaguars discussion and just talking about them and just seeing what's happened the last few years it's just been like oh my god it's just one of the most fascinating things to me in a bad way uh brian thomas gets trevor lawrence a true outside guy i really like this fit i the jaguars have created so many holes by their own doing uh, it's I've never seen anything like it. So, but they need a corner, they need pass rusher, and they need a pass catcher. So, to me, Thomas is the best remaining of that kind of group. Quinion Mitchell might be battling for him at corner, but it's between those two. So, I, I really like the Thomas pick here, and actually getting him at seventeen is pretty nice. He might sneak up a little bit. All right, the Bengals right. up. We haven't we haven't any disagreements yet. I've actually really liked this. Uh, we're going Bengals, man. They're going to be annoyed. <laughs> Who did I give them to last time? I think I went. Because they 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 are kind of going back and forth, especially their fans. I'm trying to see who's remaining. At, oh, you got to right, get right them here. a wide receiver, right? Because they can't pay T. They got to figure out some but, other weapon. I know, but I also want to like give them a tackle. <laughs> just I just want to keep just it up. You're just choosing chaos. You woke up today and you're choosing chaos. Bengals with, fans with offensive alignment, with nice and boring offensive alignment. I'm going to give them. Oh man, I mean, Mims is still on the board. By the way, that's who I was going to give them. I'm going to go with Marius Mims from Georgia. That's who I was looking at. That's like this is what's wild to me about the draft, right? Like. 
Mims is way too good to be sitting on the board at 18, but the way this fell through, like that's that, that is that's where he is. Because a team like the the Saints, yes, they need an offense alignment, but do you want to take a project E, quote unquote, left tackle or tackle only, or do we get the guy to help us out? Like, you know, like the needs change, even if the guys, another guy might be graded higher. Mims to me has more upside than just about anybody in this draft, especially offensive line. Uh, he's a right tackle at Georgia. He's only started eight games in his college career. And it's, I've compared him more to like an NBA international prospect or like, you know, like a guy that you see him doing spin moves against chairs. You're like, oh, okay, I'm going to project that a little bit. I guess that's what you're kind of doing with Mims. But he is, there's not a lot of guys that are built like that and move like that six, seven, six, eight, three forty, moves fluidly, has pretty good eyes, more like his, he's not a total, total project. Like he's, he's, his baseline's a little higher than I think he's gotten credit for. For the Bengals, though, they signed Trent Brown, but this gives them insurance and Mims can kind of ease into it. And you're getting a guy of the future that can be with Orlando Brown on the other side for a year or two, and then maybe bump him over to the left side in the long term. These are the types of moves you make. It's for a short term, midterm, long term kind of uh, type of draft pick for the Mims and for the Bengals. I think that makes sense. So at 19, the Rams are on the clock and it's time to start pissing people off. Uh, Ooh, look, I, I, look, I could go, I could be talked into Latu. I could be talked into Verse. I think those are both needs, right? I could be talked into, they, they need corner too. And uh, Mitchell is do way too good to be sitting do there. Do it, give but, it to him. No, I, I'm giving him a quarterback. Oh, Let's I think go. you're going to go Bowers here. I was so no, excited. No, I, Bowers makes a ton of sense. Yes, but he here's does. The thing. <laughs> Like Bowers makes a ton of sense. I might veto you just so but I can get what, Bowers. What there. is their long term? <laughs> what's their long term solution at quarterback? They don't have one. And like one. we both agree that Bo Nix and uh, and Michael Penix Jr. sitting right here, ah, that that like that We're might there. be a little bit of a reach. But if they're the Rams, if you're the Rams, why not? So you know what? I'm taking Bo Nix. I'm taking Bo Nix. Coming all the way in here, just choosing chaos. I'm choosing chaos for <laughs> Bo Nix to go to the Rams, where he sits and he, you know, he oh. fig- they figure out what they got. I almost, I, I almost, I, I'm going to veto you. <laughs> oh, oh, I got vetoed. I got I'm, vetoed. I'm, I'm looking at the rest of the picks. I'm like, yeah, am I going to use this one? This is a perfect chance here. I'm giving them Brock Bowers <laughs> because oh, that's amazing. I, I have yet to find have a mock so far that got Bowers that far. He always got snatched up, maybe a few spots ahead. But this is one of my ideal. Did I just ruin the mock? Uh, no. no, no, no. I'm just watching the, the action going on on the screen. Oh my god! The, did we ruin the mock stone? Did we ruin the mock? Oh my god! Okay, you know what? Just keep Bo in. Keep right, Bo in, in, and we'll I, know. we know. Uh, we know. Oh, we know. Okay. 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 We but, know. We know the Brock Bowers is going down. He's not even in there. So okay, Bowers is off now. Uh, but no, Bowers. I, I, again, wrote about him last week. The I feel like I'm pulling the string on my back. But uh, but with him, like just his usage, he is a football player. He's an off. I, I I've used the term offensive weapon, even though that term just gets thrown around for like gadget guys. He actually is one because he's two forty. Can play in the slot. Can play outside. Can play at tight end. Can play in the backfield. Um, he had over almost 200 rushing yards in his career and five rushing touchdowns in college. But I think Bowers is truly like a power slot. And how Rams use Puka Nakua and how they've used Robert Woods, how they use Cooper Cup over the years, like Bowers is a Cooper Cup replacement, long term replacement. That's who he's actually filling in for in this role. How McVay uses tight ends, how McVay uses any offensive guy. Uh, damn it, it, you just, know what I hate about this, Nate? You're right. You're this right. is such That's a dream. This is a right. dream. That's right. I, it, I know, but the quarterback, I understand your quarterback argument. Don't get me wrong, but just the Bowers one. And when I wrote that article, and I actually was, I was starting to get along, which I always do, like I do on this podcast right now. But as I was getting along, <laughs> as I was getting along in my article, all of a sudden, I had a whole section about him fitting in with the Rams. And I was like, I'm just going to cut this because now this is fan fiction. So using your show to kind of get it off. <laughs> get my I love this. <laughs> all right. So now the Steelers are on the clock after I've been vetoed. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, what are we doing with the Steelers? Oh, I gave them a uh, good corner for them. Give them Mitchell because uh, they need one. And I, I, I went Jackson Powers Johnson because all the corners were gone by the time in our last one. But I, I'll go. I'll go Quinny. I'll, I'll, yeah, let's go Quinny. Uh, right. Yeah, just give him a corner. They pair him with Joey Porter Jr., who was a hit for him. Looks like a future Pro Bowler. So I, I get some kind of, kind of a corner pairing in the future. And I think Mitchell's a he's my number one deep, uh, defense player on the board right now. Um, so, or uh, my big board overall. So I, I think he's a talented, talented player. So, uh, that means that the dolphins are up next and we get to give the pick that people are going to be looking at like dolphins have a need needs at safety. There's clearly one first round safety in this year's draft. I'm putting Cooper Dijon over Love on the it. dolphins. Like, and uh, that is uh, yep. America, look at the pictures. Uh, those aren't wrong. There's a, the, the, he, it's a rarity. I'm just saying it's a rarity. Like, uh, <laughs> but good. Cooper, 
Come on, he's he's spectacular. So and good. <laughs> by the way, he's he's capable, I think, of playing not only traditional safety, but he's capable of being a hybrid as well. And he comes from a defense where he was asked to do a lot. So if you put him into a defense where he's now asked to do a lot, he's going to thrive. So I, I think he's he becomes a real superstar. Yeah, it, there's not a lot of projecting. Like there, there's proof of concept that he's yeah, done that before. Well no, he, he my, my line with Cooper DeGene is that he is the prospect that reminds me of Jalen Ramsey the most, not saying he is Jalen Ramsey, but that versatility to play safety slot, maybe on the outside as well. And now he would get to join Jalen Ramsey in Miami. So I actually really, really like that one. All I already right, used Philly's my veto, up for you next. so I'm just going to be positive. Uh, so this one is pretty like the the Eagles are usually only going to target a couple positions. Don't think they're going to go receiver here. I'm going to look in the trenches and... Man, it's even for that, I'm kind of like going like, all right, do they want to invest more? I, I'm going to give it to him, but I'm going to go Jared Verse here, uh, mm, which is not. Pick. Yeah, I thought it was maybe go offensive line because I know they like to in- inject talent to that. I might, I think they might wait on that. So I'm going to go Jared Verse, run, like power, power, power is his game. Actually fits really well with Vic Fangio there now, but he's going to push the pocket. He's going to be good against the run, which they need defensive players that are good against the run. They like Howie Roseman likes having depth and guys to rotate. So Jared Verse it is. I actually really like that pick for you. And we'll do an, a run on edge rushers because Latu still being available for the Vikings just makes too much sense, especially they've sort of acknowledged that they're they're putting themselves in a rebuild situation. Uh, I, I think they get themselves, I'm, you know, replacing Daniil Hunter's production is going to be difficult for them, but I think Latu makes a lot of sense. So we get the little uh, run on two guys that if you'd have looked at a mock six months ago were much higher than 22-23. Yeah. Just oh my god, it. they're going top ten at some point. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that's a great call. Uh, yeah, and that, yeah, get Jonathan Grenard there. That's some juice there. That's that's fun. I really like. I don't like Latu for everybody. I like him there for the Vikings. I, I think he, that's that's good. Uh, all right, so Cowboys here. Cowboys offensive line. Jackson Powers Johnson. They need interior help. He can play center guard. He has a little. He he's still a little raw as far as like hand work and all that. You're drafting his mindset. The athleticism and the size, and and that's what you're drafting here. Put him next to Zach Martin. That stuff will get sorted out real quick. So you get him at left guard or center. You know Jackson Powers Johnson. I actually really like this. This is about where I have him slotted to as far as big board. I actually like this team fit value uh, and the player right here. Uh, so speaking of all of that, the Packers always do a good job of just oh we're sitting here and a really good player came to us. That's where I feel like I am with Nate Wiggins. Like the fact that he's still sitting here at 25. Uh, the fact that they obviously have a need in the secondary. I, I like Wiggins there. Again, somebody that I wouldn't be surprised if Wiggins ends up in the middle of the first round. It's a little bit of a flavor of ice cream that you prefer. It feels like over the course of the last month, his stock has dropped a little bit in the, the pro day. or the, the weight uh, stuff. The combine. That was the big deal, yeah. Yeah, uh, but I, I still like Wiggins a lot, and I think he, it's too good of a value where he's sitting at 25 not to take him. No, that's good. I uh, Oh, man, so now we're going to the Bucks. Bucks have been tough for me. Because uh, they they actually have done a pretty good job of kind of filling out their roster. I've kind of started leaning to maybe dropping in a corner to them, uh, but now all the corners are gone. <laughs> the ones that I've got as first round guys are kind of gone right now. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Their defensive line has kind of juiced up a little bit. All right, I'm actually all right. I'll go corner here. I'll go Kool Aid McKinstry to the Bucks. Uh, I actually like yeah, this. No, I'm vetoing you. I'm vetoing ah, you. Good. I am finding my way. To Good. put a cor- I'm putting Bo Nix in with the Buccaneers. <laughs> this one makes sense. Look, I got to find a way to get Bo into the bottom of the first round because everybody <laughs> keeps Stone telling me he's Stone is freaking gonna- out. Stone's but- like, no! <laughs> think about this. Like The w- the reason it makes sense to put Bo Nix uh, on the Buccaneers is because that contract that they gave uh, Sam Darnold, or, uh, or babe. Uh, Sam, uh, Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, <laughs> Same Lord. person. The same contract, person at this point. You know, <laughs> the uh, contract that they gave Baker Mayfield was a little like the Geno contract. It's got a pretty easy out in it. Baker had over. a really good year. I take nothing away from that. But do they really, like, is is that the set future? So why not, at this point, take a little bit of a stab here? You get yourself the opportunity to take a look at the quarterback you can develop in your Love offense this. while you're going. Baker is the type that would actually, I think, after spending a little time at, with him at the Super Bowl, I think he would be a good mentor in that room. I think he'd actually be a helpful pro pro in that room. He's, so, been, he's been humbled a little bit, too. That yeah. happens. And when you bounce around teams, all of a sudden you learn, oh, okay, this is how NFL life actually is as opposed to being your first team. So, yeah. No, I, Are we getting I, a I'm thumbs up or a thumbs down from you guys on that pick? Do we like the room? The room? The room? I went, okay, I'm getting I thumbs middle. up. Okay. I'll okay, go middle. Okay. I'll go, like, I'll go, I'll go, you know, like two o'clock or I guess you know, okay. another way. Yeah. <laughs> that does mean that Kool-Aid is still available. Although, you know, the, the draft board doesn't show as such. Yes. Kool-Aid. So now you're Kool-Aid on the clock with the cards. 
Oh, I'm, uh, okay. Well, you vetoed me with the uh, with the box, so then I go straight. Oh, I'm uh, on the clock with yeah. the box. Then now that makes sense. You get the two My for God. one. My God, like the way this board is played out, you know, and this is really interesting to me because they took the best wide receiver in this process early on, right? Are you double dipping. I kind of feel like it, like, like I, I, I would be good with Keon. Yeah, Keon. Actually, oh, no. No, do I take Xavier Worthy and just double down on all this? Oh, you're going straight juice. Hey, get out Hollywood Brown. Let's get Xavier. I like AD better. Uh, AD Mitchell better than Xavier. Yeah. Um, And they might need defense. I don't know. That's hard. No, they definitely need defense. Like, I, I could, uh, Chop Robinson would be an easy pick here, too. Like, I have no problem with Chop. Uh, I don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling the dice that they're going to go all in on making sure that Kyler has everything he needs to be great. So now you've talked me into look. Uh, I, I think Keon's a little too slow for what they need. Maybe, yeah, we'll go eighty. Ad Mitchell, I'll, you talked me into that one. Marvin, we'll Ad, Michael Wilson, Trey McBride. I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. <laughs> that you can't fan, have too many wide receivers in, fan, the, in the modern fan NFL fiction league. wise. That I'm all about this. I fan love it. Wise, yeah, I love this. No, this is great. Yeah, no, I yeah. The Cardinals with that pick have been one of my, I would say, trouble spots, but one where I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't even, I don't even know what they like. You know, so I'm just like, uh, ah, yeah. that sure, why not? Um, to the Bills, this is one I actually I shouldn't have given you AD because AD would have been perfect here. Uh, they, <laughs> they, mm-hmm. they, yeah, uh, I've actually have gone to giving them more of a defensive lineman, but again, this is kind of a, a another spot where those guys just got swooped up. If maybe going interior guy, but again, they already have Ed Oliver, so like a Johnny Newton and an Ed Oliver or two Samey, you know, so like that mm-hmm. that that's a little hard for me. I'll give them chop. I'm going to give him Chopper. I'm saying, yep, as kind of, hey, Vaughn. All right, here's new Vaughn. <laughs> Not the mm. same type of player, <laughs> but just like what we're what we're hoping we got out of Vaughn. And we haven't really gotten that now that he's gotten hurt, some other stuff. Okay, let's get that juice, that pass rusher juice. We got a lot of run pushers or pocket pushers. He's a do- different type of flavor and can play in cold weather. He's not scared yeah. of that cold. He's good with it. Yeah, no, I think that chop pick is really good. Uh, Lions on the board. And that's like, look, it doesn't matter how this thing plays out. They're going to take the top corner. So who's our best corner left here? Have we, uh, oh, did uh, we, 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 we have Kool Aid. Kool Aid. Yeah. So I actually like that. Kool Aid goes, which means we'll put Brock in there just to, to play. Yeah, yeah, but I Kool-Aid like that. McKinstry goes there. Uh, look, corner is the obvious need, and at this point, like I, I just feel like the Lions, a, a team that don't have a ton of needs, which is staggering to say, the Lions just look at the board and they say, okay, who's the best corner? And I don't care if seven corners have already gone. They're like, we'll take the eighth. I don't care. Like We will take That's whatever's left on the corner heap. Bodies. And yeah. we're getting to that range. This is where these guys are going to go. So no, I actually, Kool-Aid makes a lot of sense for them, especially mindset-wise. They, they like those kind of feisty guys, the, the Dan Campbell-ness of it. I, for the Ravens, I think they need... Trenches on either side. I'm going offensive line. What's really cool about this draft is that there are a lot of these guys that are going to go in this range would usually go in the top 20 in a normal draft. These kind of project E, oh, there's a glimpse of something, but is he, you know, hopefully we can get him in the right spot. So the guy that I'm going with for the Ravens is from BYU. It's Kingsley Suamata Ia uh, B- from BYU. He's a left Good tackle. For you for he transferred that so well, by the way. I've had to practice it. That's why, because I keep bringing yeah. him up in everything I do, and I've got I, I just spin the wheel on how I say his name. So I now I have the phonetic spelling on there. Uh, but uh, very h- high pedigree guy. He was a five star recruit. Went to Oregon, transferred to BYU, played left tackle. He started for two years. He is more of a, he has some project to him. Not to say that he's just like a lost cause right now. I think he could still be on the field as a rookie. But as far as tools, as far as testing. Hard to get big hands, long, great athlete, really good on the move, tested really well, which matches what you see on film. He's going to just need a little bit of time, but usually a guy that has true, true left tackle, blind side uh, ability to start, I think be a quality starter, usually don't get these guys at 30. Like this guy would usually go 18 at a normal draft. So I think the Ravens would sprint up if he was still there. So that brings me to the 49ers who, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I could go a couple of different ways here, but I, I like boring. I feel like with Guyton still on the board, just going offensive line feels like the safe, right thing to do here. It's a need. It, uh, it allows them to sort of bring him along. Like I, Their offensive line played okay, but uh, I think Guyton's the easy pick here. I could be tempted to add one of these wide receivers just because, I, I mean, the the thought of Xavier Worthy or Keon Coleman being this this deep into the – it just bothers me a little bit, but I'll go Guyton. I got it. Guyton feels like the safe, easy pick. 
Uh, no, that's good. I, I that's and for my again headcanon fan fiction stuff. I keep thinking 49ers are going O line. 49ers are going O line. They are going to get a right tackle and to get a guy that can bump to left tackle and replace Trent Williams. So I'm with you on this. For him, for them, I've gone Guyton. I've gone Patrick Paul from Houston. That would be a All little right. bit of a reach. I have him more of as a late second rounder. But also uh, um, Jordan Morgan from uh, from Arizona. Is he a tackle? Is he guard? Not sure. I think the 49ers would be fine. Just say, hey, you can play. <laughs> You're a warm mm-hmm. body. Get out there. Um, all right. Chiefs. Going to go receiver. Of course. The question is, which, which I one? Know. We all, I know. Because they signed Hollywood, I think they're going to go size. I'm going to give him Keon Coleman. Even if he doesn't have the juice and the long speed, his GPS numbers are better than his 40 testing. He's a ball winner. A true rebound getter. A true high pointer that actually pairs well with Rasheed Rice and Hollywood Brown and Travis Kelsey for now. So going to go with Keon Coleman. I, I I think that Mahomes hasn't had a receiver like this. So I, I just want to see him with a true guy that's going to dunk on guys in the end zone. I, I want to see that. What I'm really reminded of as we wrap all this up, Nate, is that you look at the amount of talent available at the end of the first round. I, I genuinely believe for all the conversation about the top 10 picks in this, I believe that there's a ton of value from 25 to 40 in this year's draft. Like, so a lot of these teams that we're talking about in the top 10, there's a real conversation that should start to happen at some point about the top 10 of the second round. There's still going to be a lot of guys that can come in and make immediate impact in the first 10 to 15 picks of the second round to me. I, I think it's the top 10 and like that 28 to 38 range are like the t- like two really sweet spots of this draft, maybe top 14, really. Um, I have 17 guys with true first round grades. Usually it's 15 to 20 is kind of the range there. That's good. I, I'm actually being a little hard. I could maybe bump that up to 19, but I have 32 guys with a top 40 grade. And again, that's a high number. Like it, it, I know that sounds weird. It's like, oh, I only have 30 guys with a top 40 grade. So it sounds like an oxymoron, but you're not going to have that many guys to fill out those spots truly if you, if you kind of grade it that way. But why I want to say that is the spots are tackle, receiver, and corner. Those are three of the hardest positions to find talent, and they are here in this draft. So that's what I think makes this such an interesting draft. And with the quarterbacks, of course, that always makes every draft fun. Uh, I failed you, Raider Nation. I'm sorry I didn't get us a quarterback. But maybe in the second round, the way this played out, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. uh, Penix is still there in the second round. I know what happened with Derek, how it ended not well, but you got a lot of years starting with a round two quarterback. So you can find find that guy. Yeah, we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, C-Mac, back tomorrow with the exempt list. Of course, I'm back Thursday with inside coverage. That's C-Rob and Joy and all of us hanging out. And be sure to follow Nate doing great work, not just with us, but also, of course, with The Athletic and also doing great uh, draft breakdowns. I'm finally, I'm glad we finally got to do this, dude. Like, as a longtime fan of your work and of you as a human being, I'm glad that we get to do this. Like, this was, this was fun. I know. It's just, I, I feel like I just kept going, oh, I can't do it. Or I texted you two days late and you're like, all right, I filled that spot. I, I felt bad. So now we got it. We're good. It's going to be more consistent. So we'll be good. So I'm, I'm glad we got to do it. And we got to represent Vegas a little bit. If you also, uh, if you loved good. this show, by the way, leave us a five-star review. If you didn't like this show, you're not listening to this show. It's a total different show. You're listening to some ESPN draft show. If you didn't like it, uh, leave them a one-star review. Uh, and the mo- most important thing is tell your friends, family, enemies, and everybody to hang out with us every single week as we are doing all of this fun stuff for you as we get ready for the NFL draft. Thanks for hanging out with us. Hope you enjoyed our mock draft. If you didn't, uh, I'd love any tips and tricks that you have because, you know, we can always do better. But I feel like I, uh, Nate, I give it an A+. Plus. I do too. Uh, easy A+. Plus. Mel Kuyper loved this draft. Yeah. <laughs>